state's legitimate needs onto my unquenchable lust for self-glorification. And that's a promise. And now, live from the studios of Freedom's Phoenix, Ernest Hancock. Believe me when I say we have a difficult time ahead of us. But if we are to be prepared for it, we must first shed our fear of it. I stand here without fear because I remember. I remember that I am here not because of the path that lies before me, but because of the path that lies behind me. I remember that for 100 years we have fought these machines. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here! Let us make them remember. We are not afraid! It's me, Ernest Hancock, here in the studios of Freedoms, with an S, freedomsphoenix.com. Another interesting show for you today. And we have my, my good, 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 good friend, mentor, Mr. L. Neil Smith. I got you there, Neil? Yep. Okay, here we go. I got to tell you a little story. I got um, uh, a, a gold and silver and copper story for you. We're going to have a gentleman on uh, today that went down and bought uh, Arizona commemorative coin for $3,510 for one ounce of gold <laughs> because the state can, you know, and, and it didn't comply with the law and had the weight on it and everything. So he's, so he's like suing them. Hey, I bought your one gold coin. You did it wrong. No, 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 no. So they have no idea what they got into. So we're having fun with that. The other thing is a gentleman here sent me uh, a, a link to the Prophets of Science Fiction. There's a new series on the Sci-Fi Channel that is about, uh, you know, and, and the last one, uh, didn't see it. We'll go watch on Hulu or whatever. Uh, it was Robert Heinlein. And I'm going, you know, I wonder if they contacted L. Neil Smith. Because as science fiction, fiction writers go, uh, you know, you probably were the first and the most influential on me and a lot of the activists here in the beginning of our blossoming as activists and understanding, uh, you know, there was another way. And I, and I want to ask, uh, you know, as introduction for L. Neil Smith, he, um, we first knew of him from a speech that he gave in 93, was it in That's Salt right. Lake City, 93? And right. we got a copy of this speech, and it was just so, man, you know, everybody's going on about how radical libertarians are and everything. And all they were was just, uh, you know, country club libertarians wanting to stay on the Christmas list of some uh, Republican friend that they had and not really have a, a, a burn for what real freedom meant. And L. Neil Smith called him on it. And we're just like, amen, brother. Who's this guy? He's our new best friend. We started buying all your books. So and we have our friends buy your books and we give out your books. And we get so all of a sudden it's time to have L. Neil Smith come to Arizona and, you know, meet with the peoples. Then you got an exposure of a lot of the things that you'd advocated, you know, us doing. As time has gone on, I got two things I want to talk about today. One, your new book, Down With Power. So we definitely want to get to that. The other thing is that, you know, the influences of you, when we had in the 60s, uh, science fiction really started to get into the mainstream. And I remember uh, as a kid, and certainly even up until, oh, the, you know, mid-90s, late 90s or so on, you had, if you went to the supermarket, you had a section that said science fiction. If you went to Blockbuster Video, even up until just a few years ago, you had a section. It said science fiction. Well, now they're kind of rolled into action or it's got the fantasy or it's something else, you know, about elves and dwarves. You know, it's, it's, it's always, you know, in the it used to be its own category. And one of the one of the points that they made with Heinlein, just reading the, you know, this synopsis of the, the episode that Nick sent me, is that they, in the 60s, Robert Heinlein kind of put science fiction into the mainstream. It was to where it was popularized enough that it got its own section at the grocery store. Now, what happened is, I remember you pointing that out. You're saying, look, it doesn't even have its own section anymore. Why? 
And I started to realize from being just old enough, born in 61, kind of growing up with the science fiction, and I'm seven, eight years old, and, uh, you know, here comes uh, Star Trek and all this imagined implant of the vision of the future, the Jetsons and whatever, in my young mind. I can see what they, they've been doing. It's like they need to to strip all of Generation Next of any imagination of certainly any future that doesn't include or can have as a control of all of the technology in the future of some collectivized, all-seeing brother government, we're in charge. The fact that individuals are able to take technology and go off and be free, you know, oh, heck no. And when we had any kind of inkling of that was something like serenity and firefly and so on oh snatch that bad boy off tv so i can see you know l neil kind of predicted this over a decade ago and he's just going look i can see where this is going i'm like yes and brother and everything that's happened since then he has been right so i want to ask the first thing to start off with that premise is that who influenced you? You're coming in the late 70s, all of a sudden, boom, probability broach. This Prometheus Award winner, you got, you know, launched onto the scene as award winning, man, this is the man right here. And something had to inspire you to start this off. I give you L. Neil Smith. Well, thank you, Ernie. Um, what started me off, I mean, number one, I only read science fiction as a kid. That was the only thing that interested me. I read very, very fast, so I read. I must have read thousands of, of books, and uh, the ones that I liked the best were those by Robert A. Heinlein, uh, because the, the 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 future he the various futures he talked about, and the way people were toward each other, and uh, he had this essential idea that people don't change, technology changes, civilization changes, but people remain essentially the same, and uh, whether that's true or not, it makes very, very good fiction. I was, to a degree, I was influenced by Arthur C. Clarke, even though he's a socialist. I didn't realize it until I was a, a, a little older, and there were Arthur C. Clarke books that uh, interested me, and, and Isaac Asimov, too, but I also liked Theodore Sturgeon. And the, the biggest influence on my life, aside from Heinlein, was Ayn Rand. Uh, Heinlein had a certain humanity that Rand lacked, and Rand had a certain... Um, Oh, I don't want to say rigidity. I'm, I'm groping for the word. Consistency. Well, yes, there's a rigor. That's what I wanted to say. Rigor uh, to her thinking that that Heinlein didn't uh, apparently feel was was terribly important, even though he was a great math guy and said that if you don't know math, then you don't really know anything. Uh, so, which means I don't know anything. <laughs> but it was it was Heinlein and Rand, and uh, and then to a lesser degree. Um, Rex Stout, who wrote the, the uh, uh, Nero Wolf novels, which I consider to be the most humane or humanitarian letters written uh, uh, concerning how people should be toward each other and stuff like that. And I read Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler and all that. Raymond Chandler was a, a good guide for a writer. He said, uh, the only salvation for a writer is to write. And he also said, when in doubt, bring a man with a gun in his hand through the door. And that has put to me in very good stead over the years. So those are my influences. H. Beam Piper, but I, I didn't encounter him until I was an adult. Well, now that you've uh, kind of, certainly as years have gone on, a lot of your writings have evolved not only as what you write about and uh, kind of the atmosphere that you create, but also the method i mean this graphic novel thing a lot of you know the probability broach being put into a graphic novel by scott beezer which is yeah. you know, does our magazine covers and so on very talented individual i love working with him and the that graphic novel genre he really saw this ahead of time he he had a vision in his head of probability broach and he did the, the drug carol or ebenezer scrooge is a drug warrior yeah. kind of thing you know that that took off but, well, they did they did that while they were waiting for me to finish the adaptation. And well, tell me about that, um, how that's been received. Right, well, we'll get to that when we come back. You know, the, okay. the, because the probability brooch was a powerful book that had an enormous impact on a lot of people at a time that it, they needed it. And and, and it's so you know, a lot of people have been involved in the libertarian movement. 
you know, understand what a powerful tool that is to a young mind. You know, it'll never, ever go away. And it has a really good point. We might even give away the secret when we come back. Arizona has been one of the hottest real estate markets in the past, up until the last couple of years. Homes that were once going for half a million to a million dollars in prestigious areas are now going for less than half of what the original purchase price was. That makes it a very good time to buy. So if you were ever thinking of retiring to Arizona's inviting climate and laid back and friendly lifestyle, now is the time. That's where I can help. This is Donna Hancock with Brangus Realty, and I have provided a way for you to search for properties that are of interest to you, all at your own convenience and without having to give about any personal information. Visit my webpage at DonnaHancock.com to start your search today. And when you're ready to make a move to Arizona's warm and sunny climate, please feel free to call or text me at 602-828-1819. Many are working hard to make sure Arizona is not only a beautiful place to live, but a free and peaceful one as well. So what are you waiting for? Make your move today by calling 602-828-1819. And don't forget to visit my webpage at DonnaHancock.com. It's the Onion Radio News. A spokeswoman gives birth to a spokeschild. This is Doyle Redland reporting. Tacoma spokeswoman Tammy Barker became the proud mother of a bouncing baby spokeschild last night. According to spokespeople, Barker, a spokeswoman for a Tacoma-based pharmaceutical firm, the birthing process was a major success. Peter Wahlberg, spokesman for Tammy's husband Phil, had this to say. At 9.17 p.m. last night, an eight-and-a-half-month-old spokes fetus was delivered alive and through the miracle of birth became a seven-pound, six-ounce spokes child. Spokes father and spokes mother are doing fine. Spokeswoman Barker is expected to be released from St. Robert's Hospital tomorrow. The spokes child will remain in the hospital's media care unit for several weeks of training. Doyle Redland for The Onion Radio News, online at theonion.com. This is The Onion News Network. This Your Family Today tip is brought to you by Ovaltine. Give your kids the nutrition they need to be their best. Visit us at OvaltineUSA.com. Telling your child about healthy food choices is important. Hey, hey Neil? Yes, sir. Okay, what I was thinking of doing, and we come back, we'll do from the first to the last. The probability broach was your first, wasn't it? Yes. Okay, so I'll go, all right, well, what's the secret? And the secret was, I don't know if you want to give it away, but the secret is, you know, one word change and declaration of independence thing. I don't mind giving it away. I mean, if people don't realize it by now. Okay, so so what I want to do is go ahead and start with that. I'll, I'll throw it to you to reveal the secret and why that was such a crucial change in culture and philosophy and the two parallel worlds and so on and how it led to, you know, where we are here and what you described and a lot of things that you did and here we are and the other one where we'd be more free blah 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 and you know to try and get us back to the you you know the ideal um world that you created just from one word change there is what your new book is and how that is going to bring us back blah 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 so that kind of links to there's there's an historic connection between the two books Okay, no, that's that's the point that I want to get to, but we'll start with probability brooch and the secret and then how we get to it. All right. All right, so I, that's that's where I'm going with this. We're back in 20 right. seconds. And there's plenty of political opportunity as well. From demonstrations and vigils to outreach and volunteering, <laughs> there's a lot going on in Keene. Keene is also the undisputed Liberty Media capital of the world with television, talk radio, and more all originating here. Though it's more than just activism, with regular social events each week. See what's happening at freekeen.com and get connected with video, audio, free books, a forum, and activist tools you can download and use in your area at freekeen.com. That's freekeen.com. If you enjoy LRN.FM, please contribute to your favorite shows via their websites and become an amplifier at amp.lrn.fm. That's (laughs) amp.lrn.fm. Roads. It's the Ernest Hancock Show. Where we're going, there aren't any roads. Well, there, there were some kind of roads. You know, in, in L. Neal Smith's book, The Probability Broach, it was like, you know, kind of grass half pipes where hovermobiles just went along you know and the and the and deer and antelope played i mean it was a totally different world now in the probability brooch and we're going to go from that his first book 
to his latest book, Down With Power. Now, the one thing that I remember that was so unique, it really got you right up to the end in the probability brooch was this. There is a brooch in dimensions. You have parallel universes, and you find a, you know bad guys in this uh, dimension, you know, as we go into this collectivist whatever is, even from the Declaration of Independence. I mean, they have the same kind of hero in one world. George Washington's a hero in the other world. He's a freaking traitor and hung up by, you know, the people's kind of thing. Now, what was the difference? Why, why did that happen? You know, the probability broach, the broach between two dimensions, and you had in one world the same people, just totally different life, living the Jetson world. And in this one, I remember going through, it's a, uh, Detective Bear, I think his name is, and he's the, the focal point of this whole thing in both universes and he is there and he's sitting on the corner and they're closing down all the fast food restaurants and everything because of uh uh health reasons and they justified and and you got to have you can't have all these different hamburger joints out making all these different kind of fast food uh entrees for everybody and them getting the pick because it's an inefficient use of energy when you could just uh, have one big giant cafeteria for everybody going through like it's THX 1138 or something. Okay. So this was predictive, you know, in the late seventies, you know, all the things about, you know, fuel and economy and, and central planning to get to the point that diversity and choice was beaten out of everywhere. And all of a sudden we're going into the doldrums of just depression, you know, like uh, where we are like today. So this was predicted and now we have, there was a reason for it. There was one reason why from the same common history, there was a change in history, one word, and it sent us in two totally different directions. Now we come decades later, L. Neil Smith, his latest book, Down With Power, he has, you know, uh, well, this is how we got here and this is why, and this is how to get back to where we should be or where humanity should have been evolving to to begin with, L. Neil Smith and probability probability broach predicted the internet as we have it now. It was described in the book. I'm sitting, I'm going, yeah, you know, yep, here we go. So that's why, you know, from the imagination of L. Neil Smith in the mid 90s, when we got our first email account, that's why we were able to conceptualize what was coming with Freedoms Phoenix and how we'd set it up and the broadband and the video and the activism and everything. On the internet, we were free to imagine it already in our heads because of the inspiration of L. Neil Smith. This is the power of ideas. He already mapped out what was possible in our heads. We had the, the, the outline. We had the blueprint already ready because L. Neil Smith had done it, you know, 15 years before. And we go, yeah, baby, here we go. And we recognized it. Thank you, L. Neil. Now, what I need you to do now, what I want you to do is go ahead and describe for us the 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 whole premise, the whole where the divergence was in history from the probability brooch. You had you know the totalitarian state yeah. and the free state, and go ahead and explain that, and then how this latest book kind of brings that together. Well, people are kind of uh, familiar now with the idea of the butterfly effect, and while I'm and I'm not a, as rigid a follower of that idea as some people are. That's kind of what happened here. The idea came from the great teacher Robert Lefebvre, um, and I wanted to build a country where mistakes had never been made, so I, I, I took Bob's idea, and this is it. If the Declaration of Independence had said that government derives its just powers from the unanimous consent of the governed, our history would have been very very different. But what was unique? Seven. Wasn't that the original intent of Jefferson? Didn't they make him take that out? Uh, no, uh, in in real history, they they did not make him take that out. That was a. I'm not sure where the notion came from. It might have been original with Bob, um, uh, but uh, I I inserted that there because uh, when I was mentioning all the people who had an effect on me, I, I callously or, or uh, churlishly forgot him. He is a giant whose shoulders I stand on. So I built a country that, A, had that provision in it of, of uh, not just majoritarianism, but, uh, you know, if it ain't unanimous, it ain't happening. Uh, at least the government's not going to do it. 
and, uh, uh, and, and tried to build a country that had never made any mistakes along the path from 1776 to, to now. And in those days, now was, well, I, was, I started writing the book in 1977, and uh, it was published uh, in December of 79. So uh, during those, those years, uh, I tried to build a country where uh, uh, that unanimous consent rule was applied, and the non-aggression principle was applied, as it was called then, and see what kind of country that would create. And the first thing you understand is it's going to be technologically greatly advanced. The second thing that happens is when you run across an official and you assert your rights, he's not going to laugh at you or hit you in the teeth with a billy club um, because everybody's armed. And uh, there isn't that much government anyway. At at this point, the book is happening in 1987, which was 10 years in the future (laughs) when I started writing it. And uh, uh, Congress hadn't met since 1957. There's just been no no need to. I mean, you know, they, they figured they had enough laws. And that was hardly any laws, of course. So that's the idea. Uh, unanimous consensus of governed is, is what's really important. Well, in the in the book, because I, you know, it's been a while since I read it, but I, I remember the impact it had on me. And as I recall, it was what changed the course of the Whiskey Rebellion. Yes, yes. So go ahead uh, and describe that. Well, uh, what happened there is uh, Albert Gallatin, who was a real person, he was a Swiss immigrant to Western Pennsylvania, or you know, a gentleman farmer, and he did a lot of other thing, interesting things too. He was an academic and was the first serious student of Indian languages. He invented ethnology, but in any case, um, in my world, Gallatin looks at the Declaration of Independence, sees that word uh, "unanimous consent of the governor," and realizes that the U.S. government is going back on promise that that represented by taxing whiskey, and only whiskey, uh, without the consent of uh, the people who were making the whiskey, the people whose whiskey it was. And so uh, he was worried. In, in the real world, he went and sort of talked them down because he was afraid his neighbors who were making whiskey were going to get killed by the federal government. In my world, he goes and you know, leads them with this philosophy of unanimous consent, and there's a, a stirring moment where he gives a, they, they reach the encampment of the government, and he gives a stirring speech. Oh, everything. stirring speech! We come back with a stirring speech. <laughs> you, know, you can see how decades of of just thought and imagination can have an impact on a lot of people. The entire direction, you know, the butterfly effect of L. Neil Smith's books has had an impact on the entire planet. I give you. The Love Illusion. We'll be right back here on Declare Your Independence. L. Neil Smith and Ernie, just a little bit. If you want to move to the freeze. Okay, so those don't forget where we left off. You know, it's oh, unanimous oh. consent and he and whatever. Because he did lead the Whiskey Rebellion, didn't he? No, he, he toned it down in real life. He, he, he liked his neighbors, uh, the farmers who grew corn and made it into whiskey. And it was an economic measure. They didn't have any way of storing corn in those days, except drying it out. And I imagine in western Pennsylvania that wouldn't be as easy as it is, as, as it is here in Colorado. Or okay, there, okay. In Save all this for the show, okay? Don't tell me now. So go ahead. Okay. So when you come back, you know, the, because, you know, when he kind of talked down, who's the guy that uh, was kind of leading the Whiskey Rebellion or surrendered or whatever? Oddly enough, it was a, a local sheriff named Hamilton. Mm, okay, so... So when they kind of said, okay, I guess it was this guy that toned, called him, you know, kind of calmed him down. But in your parallel with the unanimous, it was, he didn't. So no. that was the difference. So let's talk about that specific right there. All right. All right. We'll be back in a little bit. Okay. Sights and watched videos. You've made liberty your life's goal. But something seems to be missing. Stickers. From LibertyStickers.com. Exercise your freedom of speech with the world's most dangerous bumper stickers. That's LibertyStickers.com. But wait. 
There's more. You can buy Liberty Snickers wholesale. Get them for 99 cents each when you put 100 or more in your shopping cart in any combination. Sell them or give them away. They're great for gun shows, flea markets, fairs, outreach, and more. Earn extra money, promote freedom, and spread the word. Need custom stickers, labels, or decals for your organization or business? Liberty Stickers makes them. Go to libertystickers.com to order or call 877-873-9626. Libertystickers.com, the world's most dangerous stickers. Do you want to take back control of your own money? Then take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the world's first decentralized, anonymous internet currency. And it's gaining popularity every day. It's free to use, free to accept, and free from inflation forever. You can use Bitcoins anywhere in the world. To learn more, visit weusecoins.org. Your dollars are going down. Learn more about Bitcoins at weusecoins.org. That's weusecoins.org. Instead of just listening, you can also watch. See the Liberty Radio Network's key New Hampshire-based live shows via our studio cam at cam.lrn.fm. Plus, you'll still be able to listen to the Liberty Radio Network via the cam feed in high quality 24-7, even when there's no live show being produced in our keen studio. But wait, there's more. Our chat room is built into the cam page so you can interact with other listeners online. Listen, watch, and chat. All free at cam.lrn.fm. That's cam.lrn.fm. We live in an era of permanent warfare. America currently has soldiers and Marines deployed in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, and now expanding further into Uganda, South Sudan, Central African Republic, Congo, and Nigeria. Hi, this is Scott Horton, inviting you to tune in to Anti-War Radio weekdays from noon to 3 Eastern Time here on the Liberty Radio Network bringing you America's best journalists, columnists, lawyers, and activists on the subject of our overseas empire, its attendant domestic police state, and the folly of central banking, which makes it all possible. That's Anti-War Radio, Monday through Friday from noon to 3 Eastern time here on the Liberty Radio Network, lrn.fm. Full interview archives can be found at antiwar.com slash radio. Anti-War Radio, revisionist history, in real time. You can watch the LRN Studio Cam and chat with other listeners anytime at cam.lrn.fm. That's cam.lrn.fm. It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. To be a part of the show, call 602-264-2800. Welcome back to Declare Your Independence with me, Ernest Hancock, and one of my favorite, favorite people in the whole wide world, L. Neal Smith. Had big influence on me when I was in my twenties. Uh, you know, a young man uh, looking for an opportunity to express myself. And uh, if you're going to, you know, you're going to go full. I mean, a lot of the young people, they want to express themselves. They want to go whole hog into it. They just don't know what to say or how to say it or to advocate for what or why. Well, no, Smith did a lot of that thinking for you and gave you an opportunity to just kind of look at it from a different perspective and historical. You go back to uh, the Declaration of Independence and the ideas that were swirling around then and the promise made. Because the Declaration of Independence preceded the Constitution by a long time. And they just said, hey, 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 hey. You had the the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, and then, uh, you know, I smell a rat. So you had the Bill of Rights saying, no, 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 we're going to put some chains on this thing. Well, in that process, immediately the Whiskey Rebellion started up because didn't we fight a revolution to stop this central planning, uh, you know, going to tax mine, do and take? And and I I was paying less under King George. Didn't even know they were there. And all of a sudden I got this new government here saying they lay claim to my goodie. What? So the Whiskey Rebellion came. Washington comes in with, I don't know, 12, 15,000 soldiers to put down these damn Pennsylvanian farmers that wanted to, you know, just be free. And they're going all four hundred. All four hundred of them. Oh, is that all it was? Was four <laughs> yeah, hundred? And, and they had like tax troops. guys coming in. They're actually tar and feathering and so on. So yeah. this started the beginning of a new American revolution right away. Washington, first president, and he said, "Oh heck no, we're going to put that bad boy down with uh, overwhelming force." So that's what happened. Now in the book, the difference is in one. 
um, the timeline that we live in now, they kind of like, okay, and they got talked down by someone in the, the parallel universe with Al Neal because of one word change in the Constitution, in the uh, Declaration of Independence. They didn't, and they just said, no, hell no. So let's go ahead and pick it up there and talk about the, the real history and who this was that kind of talked down the rebellion. Who was the rebellion, Neil? Oh, well, sure. The, uh, the rebellion in, in real life was uh, multi-headed, kind of like the Tea Party, but the one person who stands out is a guy whose name, coincidentally, was Hamilton. And at the moment, I can't remember what his, what his first name was, but you can find it in my book, uh, uh, The uh, Gallatin Divergence. In any case, um, in in the probability brooch, though, Albert Gallatin, who was a Swiss emigre and settled in western Pennsylvania, um, decided that uh, because he was so moved by this unanimous consent notion, decided to uh, help organize and lead the rebellion, and they marched on Philadelphia. The Whiskey Rebellion, in real life and in uh, in my story, was centered on organized at the Mingo Creek. Church not far from from uh, Pittsburgh, they marched to Philadelphia, and in my book, they seized George Washington, put him up against the wall, and shoot him. And Alexander Hamilton, uh, the guy who fought all this crap up with his whiskey tax, flees to Europe, where he's killed in a duel in 1804, the same year he's killed in a duel here. So, uh, and then history proceeds there as from 1794 when when all this happened. Uh, government just keeps getting smaller and smaller, less important in people's everyday lives. And so we have the North American Confederacy, which we see in the, in the 1980s. Uh, although they count their calendar from uh, the 4th of July, 1776. But in any case, uh, uh, we see what's like then, and they're technologically advanced. There are certain critters that are thought of as animals in our culture, which uh, are full members of society, mostly uh, chimpanzees and gorillas and dolphins. And, uh, and in fact, it's a dolphin physicist who invents the, the scientific means by which wind bear is, uh, comes across to, uh, to the other side. And, you know, and that's, that's the story. Of that's how they got from here to there. You know, the one thing that I also remember is that um, it's kind of like New Hampshire kind of deal to where... When Congress meets, it's whenever, I don't know, they feel like it. And uh, it's in the most uncomfortable, unair conditioned. <laughs> you know, kind of, yes. You know, you know, we're not we're not on vacation. And it's in, it, it, the present site is Volta, North Dakota. <laughs> and now, 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 this is the other thing that I remember. Now, included, you started having sentient, uh, sentient beings, you know, the, the, the dolphins and gorillas start to speak and all this kind of stuff. And yeah. But what was interesting is that each individual congressman had their own uh, constituency that was not based on a geography. It's how many of the American people said, you know, I'm with that guy, you know? As they speak on the uh, congressional floor, like when you have Ron Paul doing these one-minute, five-minute addresses to, you know, the empty chamber kind of thing, there'd be people voting right then as they're talking and all of a sudden, his numbers would go up. You know, it'd be like 500,000 yeah. to 5 million. Yeah, what well, he said. And as people go, you had the representation based on the people that they support what they were saying. And I'm yeah. going, you know, how unique is and only available with kind of a webcasting kind of thing and this interactive guy that you, you know, we can do now and that you had to already imagined in your mind, you know, decades before. So that's, yeah. this is the advantage of a science fiction writer. I think so. I think so. Uh, uh, my inventions, and I, I have predicted lots and lots of things, but uh, mostly my inventions in my books just answer a necessity that the people in the books have. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it gets harder and harder as I go along because more and more of the future that I wrote about is actually happening. Uh, there are things I missed. Uh, no, I don't think anybody predicted that telephones would come with built in cameras. What what kind of an idea is that? Yeah, Everybody it's called a Dick that. Tracy watch. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh no, but this is a you know people use their cameras to take pictures of uh, Aunt Sally at the edge of the Grand Canyon and stuff like that. And and uh, I I never predicted that that would happen, but uh, I use my cat in my phone all the time. So you just try to figure out what. 
people will devise to meet some necessity. Well, now we let's, let's let's go ahead and make the transition from that to now. Your latest book is more. I I wouldn't say down with power has anything to do with science fiction, other than bringing it all together and how we should live. Or is that, no, you know, it's a it's a nonfiction book. It's a policy manual, and I wrote it for for four different groups of people. I wrote it for people who want to know what libertarianism is about. People who are not libertarians right now. I wrote it for people people who had just become libertarians, so they could become firmer and more consistent in their beliefs. I wrote it for uh, Libertarian Party candidates because, as you probably have observed, it tends to be the younger, newer libertarians who are moved to run for office, and they can use it as a campaign manual. And finally, I wrote it uh, for the Nerf libertarians to embarrass and drive them out of the movement. And I, in that, I was very highly motivated by the Bob Barr campaign, which I thought was disgusting. And uh, and I watched it happen. I was at the, uh, as you know, I was at that convention, and and uh, just to see him railroad his way through. Uh, and he's not a libertarian by any stretch. So I, you know, in this book, I it's I don't do any real theory uh, because there's plenty of books that do that. I tackle issues. I tackle, tackle 37 issues, um, and uh, I do have a, a slight explanation of the zero aggression principle and the importance of the Bill of Rights. But the funny thing is, this might have been my first book, because when I decided I would write for a living, I started a nonfiction book, and I started a fiction book. One was called The Constitution Conspiracy, and it eventually became The Probability Approach, and one was called, always was called, Down with Power. Uh, and I since lost the what, the original manuscript to that, but uh, so I'm, I've ended up writing both of the books that I had planned to write when I first started writing. Down with Power is the non-fiction culmination of, of my ideas as a libertarian. Although I regard it as sort of loosely, and we'll add to it. You know, we, we, in the last segment here, we'll get into what's the central driving force behind Down With Power. You know, why Down With Power? Who's power? What power? And how do you get it down? You know, this is, you know, El Neal has always been very edgy, on the edge, the edge of the envelope. Let's don't sugarcoat it. Make sure they understand the underlying principle and go all the way. All of a sudden, it makes Ron Paul look moderate. (laughs) We know you're out there. We can feel you now. We know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. We don't know the future. We aren't here to tell you how this is going to end. We're here to tell you how it's going to begin. We're going back to editing the next edition of Freedom's Phoenix Digital Magazine now, where we are telling the people what you don't want them to know. We're showing them a world without you, a world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries, a world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice we leave to you. Subscribe at freedomsphoenixeasy.com. That's freedoms with an S, phoenixeasing.com. Why did you move to the Shire? I moved here to the Shire because there's other people around who take liberty just as seriously as I do. I moved to the Shire because I saw videos of people challenging authority and thought that I could get support myself. It called to me, like, do this right now. I wanted to be around people like me who got it. And once I got here, I knew there was nowhere else that I wanted to be. Immigrating to the Shire was easy. I was instantly plugged into a community of individuals who also care about peace, liberty, and justice and are willing to do something about it. The people here are awesome, loving, and positive. It was for the adventure and for the feeling of something important is happening here. And I just wanted to come to sort of be part of that. Visit ShireSociety.com to read and sign the Shire Society Declaration and learn the reasons why, if you love liberty, you should immigrate to the Shire. Plus, add yourself to the Shire map at ShireSociety.com. That's ShireSociety.com. Do you want to support good people who disobey bad laws? The Civil Disobedience Evolution Fund was created to support the brave men and women who are saying no to aggressive government. With your contribution, you can support civil disobedience and non-cooperation now while encouraging more in the future. 
As cdevolution.org grows, we hope to provide activists with legal and public relations assistance, as well as delivering timely information on the growing civil disobedience movement. To play your part in the peaceful evolution, visit cdevolution.org. It's cdevolution.org. Did you know you can get news updates about what's happening with the Liberty Radio Network delivered in the way you prefer? You can sign up for our email updates at updates.lrn.fm. Plus, you can stay in the loop by joining our Facebook profile at facebook.lrn.fm or follow us at Twitter at twitter.lrn.fm. It's all free. So sign up now at updates.lrn.fm for news updates delivered to your email box, facebook.lrn.fm to follow our Facebook page, and twitter.lrn.fm to receive our tweets. Anyone can publish on the Internet, but not everyone is publishing material suited for online reading. According to the Yahoo Style Guide, it cautions that Internet content has a few seconds, three or less, to encourage people to read more, to take action, or navigate to another one of your pages. So make it easy for readers to pick and choose. Isn't that the way you poke around online? Use short words, short sentences, short paragraphs, bulleted lists, and short pages. Front load what you write, putting the most important information at the beginning of headlines and paragraphs and sentences. Same goes for your keywords. What someone would likely type into the search box on Yahoo or Google. For more tips on communicating better online or in a job interview or everyday life, hit survivalspeech.com. I'm Holland Cook. You're listening to the best Liberty-oriented audio streamed around the clock, on the air and online. This is the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Freedom is the answer. What's the question? I want to break free. You're listening to Ernest Hancock. I want to break free. Yeah, we all want to break free. How you do that? Yeah, you know, it's like, I, I, I just broke free. I declare my independence. See how easy it was? No government forms, no forms, just an imagination and a will. And it doesn't even mean you have to. A lot of people, they're looking for, i tell you what it is. It's insecurity. I know so many people, you know, the big, you know, chest out Republican NRA kind of gun toting doing kind of gift that. I see this made me free. I got my gun, you know, or I need some absolution or I need sanction from the government. You know, even you even start thinking that way, you know, you're already lost. How about, you know, I'm just free. I don't even need anything. I'm just here. I'm free. Done. Oh, so you're going to be a bad guy and you're going to incarcerate me. You're going to force me. You're going to, well, whatever. I may be a hostage, a captive or whatever. That doesn't mean I'm any less free. It just means you're a thug, you know? <laughs> so I may want to, you know, be creative in my, you know, de you, you know? And that's, uh, L. Neil Smith definitely goes on about that. Oh, the book Palace. Palace is an asteroid, uh, an asteroid, but yeah, you read Palace and you get all kinds of de-thuggerizing. <laughs> the, yeah. So I, 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 we're down, we're in the down with power and I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that the people understand that it's libertarian philosophy as applied practically to yeah. issues politically for certainly the young people coming in because they've been so, you know, politically corrected brow beaten MTV Fox News crap into what to think about something and you have always been our source of edginess. I mean I mean the 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 more the opposition screams the more harm you know you're doing them. <laughs> yeah, that's and, exactly right. So so go ahead and how all these aphorisms that you had, all these sayings that we went on. I mean I've even written articles on all your stuff. You know, you do a <laughs> Google search on Freedom 101, Ernest Hancock, and it'll come up an article I've had published several places, even in the um, uh, oh, newspapers here, you know, about why is it always guns, you know, as a ripoff yeah. of you that I asked permission, and I ripped it off, and got it in the Arizona Republic as a guest article. I mean, these are things that came from L. Neil Smith on no compromise as it comes to advocating as a candidate. Going up against these guys and not trying to be politically correct. It's the only thing that, you know, imagine, you know, gets the people's imagination going and gets them actually thinking. So how did you apply that in an entire book to do what you did for us in one book for the next generation of libertarian candidates? Well, I wish I felt the book was more exhaustive. It's one of those things that, you know, 
somebody says, you know, with about great art that it's never finished, it's just abandoned. And in some ways, that's true. I had, you know, I just finally had to break off and say, okay, the book is done, and I will add to it in other editions. But one of the reasons I wrote it was because I had been a member of the platform committee uh, of the National Libertarian Party twice in the 70s, and we wrote a wonderful document. I won't go on to say anything more about it, except it was just as libertarian as it could be. And I was proud to be part of it. And then, at first gradually, and then in a great race, um, the wimps that took over uh, butchered the platform. And uh, so it's this, this skinny little remnant of itself right now, a political wet noodle. And uh, so I decided, okay, I'm going to write a complete platform for libertarians. And that's what Down With Power became. I took on, as I said, 37 issues, and I picked the toughest ones first. Um, and, you know, someday the book will be twice the, the thickness it is now and contain, you know, many more issues. But right now, these are the things that people have to uh, to concentrate during this election year and for some time to come. So, uh, Well, what is the underlying uh, principle? I mean, if you had to pick one... It's uh, thou shalt leave me alone or something? I mean, what is... Well, they, no, I define libertarianism as, as consisting of two tenets. Number one, each and every one of us is the sole proprietor of his or, own, his or her own life and all the products of that life. Uh, you, you own yourself. You own your life. Nobody else does. You own all that you make and do with your mind and hands. And sometimes that's a good thing, like money and houses and stuff like that. And sometimes that's a, a, a bad thing that you must nevertheless um, uh, own up to, and that's producing smoke you know, from your chimney or uh, garbage or something like that. You have to be responsible. Now, the political expression of I mean, one person could live alone like that. Robinson Crusoe could live like that. But when you get people together in a civilization, then the other principle comes into play, and that is that nobody, under any circumstances, has anything even remotely resembling a right to initiate physical force against another human being for any reason. And that is, that's what I call the zero aggression principle. Some people call it the, the non-aggression principle, but that spells NAP as an acronym, and I don't like that. So <laughs> we have ZAP instead, the zero aggression principle. If people live by the zero aggression principle, life would be a dream. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the great things about the internet is that you cannot initiate force across the internet. Eh, you can come close to it by sending out viruses and tapeworms and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, nobody can beat you up and kill you over the internet. And the society, which has, has been created by the internet, is essentially a libertarian one. I hear conservatives and, and uh, progressives complain all the time that libertarians own the Internet. And we do, morally and ethically, we do. Well, this has been, uh, the Internet has been used, you know, to cause pain. I mean, you contract with somebody to go do whatever, but I understand what you're saying. There's no, yeah. you know, there's, there's no club coming out of my screen and pounding me on the head, you know. But, That's right. But the thing is, is that I, I'm, I'm looking at, at what can be the best analogy, the best description, the best representation of a libertarian society. And I, it's hard for me to think of something better than the Internet itself. I mean... Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. I mean, I've, I've created whole separate societies. Because one of the things I recognize is that uh, there's not just one libertarian future. There's as many as people can think up. Um, so I created the world of probability brooch, and that's one kind of libertarian culture. Then I created the world of palace and follow-up novel series. You, you're going to love, if you haven't already read it, you're going to love the airport security scene in, in series. Um, and that's another kind of world when people complain that the brooch world was uh, uh, inaccessible. I created the, the world of palace and series. And then I created it yet again on an asteroid called Eris 523, a uh, libertarian society run by uh, those creatures which had come to the top to the, of the evolutionary pyramid in each of their own separate worlds of probability. So I have all these sort of aliens, dozens or hundreds of different kinds of aliens, but they all come from Earth. 
different versions of Earth, and the and the oldest that we first run into are the elders, who are giant ammonites, you know, the like squid in a shell curled up, uh, and they've been around for half a billion years, and they've tried everything, they had nuclear wars even and stuff, and finally came around to the idea of the of the non-aggression principle. So, and they have even so like a rabbi kind of guy, but he has a sword, and it's his job to you know when people ask, have I been ethical? He analyzes the situation and tells them. Sometimes they've done something they can't make up for, and that's what his sword is for. <laughs> I mean, uh, and he doesn't pre- he doesn't press that on them. They request that service to show that they're willing to offer the token restitution, the maximum token restitution that they can. It's kind of a complex philosophy, but I'm trying very hard to put this kind of thing to work. Well, so before, words, we, before the end of the show, I, I want to sure. real quick get to the point that the— um, the young people reading the book Down With Power, yes. what do they come away with uh, being armed in running for office? I mean, that's really what it was for, is to make sure that they yeah. have some kind of foundation and understanding so they don't wimp out under the pressure of lights and, you know, a, a hostile moderator. I mean, that's well, really what it's for, isn't it? Yeah. If they stay within libertarian principle, which is the non-aggression principle, the zero-aggression principle, then nothing else is too extreme. Nothing else is too radical. It's all promises of the future that's infinitely better than the world we live in now. So, you know, um, for example, I want the Internet to be absolutely unsupervised. And uh, the, the chapter in that, in the book, is keep your filthy hands off the Internet. Now, this has been another great treat for all of us. And I, I want to make sure, how do they get the book i mean amazon.com you can put my name in and put down with power in down with power amazon.com put in l neil smith i'm sure all his books will blow up all over the place and it, down with power has been something that we've been you know been waiting for for a long time i know l neil's been thinking about this and we we raised money made sure that people knew it was coming he, and he, and he got it together, and, he, and it's done. It's done. In time. In time for this election cycle, for the young minds, just like mine, and a lot of my friends here in Arizona, where everything comes out of Arizona, it was just getting a glimmer, a glimmer from some articles from L. Neil Smith, and now you have a book. A book. Uncovering the secrets and exposing the lies. That's what readers of freedomsphoenix.com get every day. All right, there we go. Push the book. Boy, it really, really always seems like a very short time. On yeah. The radio with you or any. Everybody always says, they go, an hour. Oh, my God, I can't do it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's going to go by really quick. <laughs> well, I, I, I did five hours on Coast to Coast once, so I know it's doable. Damn. <laughs> Brian Wilson, what did you do, you know, read Brian, all your books? <laughs> no, no, no. Brian Wilson was sitting in for Art Bell. You know Brian, don't you? Uh, I hear the name. I don't I don't know these guys. Okay, he's, a, he's a great guy. You would adore him as i do he has also recorded uh, the nagasaki vector and that's available at cd baby right now and he's going to record down with power very cool yeah yeah, yeah i look so forward be- to that i like this audio book thing hey you know um last edition of the magazine the uh um war one glenn jacobs you know kane from the wwe yeah. Glenn Jacobs read Smedley Butler's speech, and uh-huh. MP3 of that was cool. You know, that was a really oh, good man. idea, so we can publish that. You know, um, for your book, you know, the one thing this month is about, uh, did Donna send you an invitation to write? Actually, you talked to me about it, too, and I can hardly wait to get started on it. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, whatever. You know, silver, uh, money, I, economy, yeah. cyberspace. Uh, we got some professional... Uh, writing, doing some, some of the guys are doing all this stuff on, you know, explaining how BitTorrent works and Bitcoin and cyber yeah. and security and PGP and all this, uh, everything, encryption. Well, I intend to, to explain why the development of the Internet is even a bigger uh, historical change than Gutenberg's printing press. Yeah, I don't think even the young people now under, because they grew up with it, they don't really understand the galactic shift yeah because of it they don't they don't they, they know it's a big deal they know it suck without it they do i but they don't really get it i don't think they really understand how this is like it's going to be looked back 
you know, hundreds, thousands of years from now, at this was when it happened. Yes, and all that happened, and I will explain this in my article, all that happened was communications uh, flipped from a vertical, top-down kind of thing to a horizontal, sideways form of communication among equals. Yep. It tipped over 90 degrees. And I, you know, that's, I, you know, here we go. I, you know, I always thought everybody's, I was born too early. I was born too late. I always thought I was mm-hmm. born at just the right time. I was just old enough to, you know, vividly remember the man stepping foot on the moon. You yeah. know, I remember all of the, you know, from Pong <laughs> to yeah. where we are now. I mean, you know, I, I'm going, look, man, I was there. I saw the, the evolution. It couldn't go fast enough for me, but it's going pretty freaking fast. If I recall, you're about 15 years younger than I am. I'm 50 years old. I'll be 51 yep, in the March. Okay, well, I'll be, I turn 65 in, uh, in uh, May. So. Social Security. Social Security. Give me my Social Security. I don't think that there's anything there for me. <laughs> oh, you you apply anyway. <laughs> give no, me, I might. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. I mean, God knows I paid enough taxes. Yeah, screw, it doesn't matter anyway. Buy you a loaf of bread. The um, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm I. You know these young guys. 